Colleagues, welcome. It is my great pleasure to introduce the first keynote speech of the 2024 DSA conference at SOAS, delivered by my colleague, dear feminist friend and co-conspirators on many feminist uh, political economy projects, Shirin Rai. I've been inspired, as I'm sure many of you, by her work for over 20 years uh, since I joined SOAS, in fact, as a graduate student. So for me, it's truly a great privilege uh, to introduce you, Shirin. Shirin Rai is a distinguished research professor in the Department of Politics and International Studies at SOAS. She is a fellow of the British Academy, and before coming to SOAS, she was the founding director of the Warwick Interdisciplinary Center for International Development. Interdisciplinarity permeates Shirin's work. Her research interests are in the political economy of development, gender and political institutions, and performance and politics. Her latest books include the Oxford Handbook of Politics and Performance in 2021, co-edited with Gluhovic, Jastrovic, and Soward, uh, uh, Performing Representation, Women Members in the Indian Parliament with Carol Sperry, another OUP volume in 2019. Her latest book, Depletion, the Human Cost of Caring, will be published in July this year, also by OUP, and inspires the talk that she's about to deliver today. Shirin is a true powerhouse, so she's already working at her new manuscript, uh, provisionally titled Doing Politics Sideways. Shirin will treat us with a talk on social reproduction, depletion, and in crisis. There can hardly be a more apt theme to kick off our DSA conference, whose theme is on social justice and development in a polarizing world. Depletion through social reproduction, an expression she uh, coined, uh, and the crisis it escalates is indeed a key matter for social justice and the politics around it. It is particularly hard to talk about depletion, as well as social justice this year, as we're witnessing an escalation of violence, destruction, and injustice across our planet. For this reason, we cannot start this conference without an acknowledgement of the times we're living and the horrors we're witnessing. And I want to thank Laura for already hinting at it in the original introduction to the old conference. So before we start, and in agreement with Shirin and with the old SOAS DSA organizing committee, I would like to acknowledge the genocide currently taking place in, pa in Palestine, as well as large-scale violence in various parts of our planet, including in Ethiopia and Sudan. Palestinian people are currently at the receiving end of the worst form of depletion of all, that to see their very ability to survive entirely wiped out, that to see the fruit of reproduction and life itself, the children dying in numbers that also, according to the United Nations, we've never seen before in recent times. In the words of Philippe Lazzarini, UNRWA Commissioner General, and I'm quoting, this war is a war on children. It is a war on their childhood and their future. We, and uh, uh, I hope most in uh, this room, stand in solidarity with Palestinian people, children, women, and men, and we call for an immediate end to this uh, unacceptable violence. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Shirin Rai at uh, DSA 2024 at SOAS. She will talk for 45 minutes, and this will be followed by a Q&A session of around the same time. Shirin, welcome. Thank you, Mike, and uh, the DSA committee. Uh, for inviting me to give this lecture. I'm honored. Thank you, Alessandra, for your generous um, and thoughtful introduction. The conference theme explores, as has been already said, what thinking about global development from a social justice perspective can offer us in a polarizing world. 
and particularly in the areas of rights and representation, redistribution and restoration, and reproduction and production. In my talk, I take inspiration from these themes, particularly about theorizing work and pursuing redistribution through political activism to center social justice. And through reflecting on the costs of both work and activism. To do so, I will also draw, as Alexandra has already said, from my new book, Depletion, the Human Costs of Caring. My previous work on parliaments has focused on the gender gap in political representation. Legislation and laws are made in institutions that are skewed towards particular understandings of what counts as work, which in turn affects who is seen to be contributing to the economy. And as we have seen in the last 14 years in this country, one of the richest in the world, where austerity cuts fall in times of crisis. Despite changes to the global capitalist system in terms of organization of production and reproduction, of exchange and accumulation, of um, work continues to be framed in peculiarly gendered ways. Specifically, work that is done in some spaces by some bodies cutting across the boundaries of production and reproduction continues to be excluded from our understanding of the economy with devastating effects. The argument at the heart of my book and of this paper, together with, I stand together here at SOAS in particular, with fantastic feminist political economists, is as follows. Reproduction of life doesn't just happen. It is labored over in different contexts and with differential resources unequally. In all countries, in all classes, races, religions, and cultures, women perform these labors more than men. But these women are classed, raced, and located in deeply unequal ways, and therefore experience depletion in very different ways intersectionally. Women who cope with this work in contexts of poverty and of violence are constantly told that their everyday labors, both paid and unpaid, to maintain the rhythms of life do not count in and as production. And yet we rely on this work every day and know that without this work, we will not survive as a global population, culture and community. <laughs> However, as a global society, we fail to recognize this labor in our, as we fail to recognize this labor in our everyday lives, and we continue to deny its appropriate inclusion in the discourses about work, in our national budgets, and in policy frameworks. The exploitation of this work of life giving and its maintenance depletes lives and generates crises of care that threatens not just livelihoods, but lives as well. The denial of this work is institutionalized through our methodologies of accounting for work, through our ideological positioning of domestic work, through cultural and social gendered norms. Marilyn Waring, a UN statistician, a feminist economist, noted that, and I quote, when you are seeking out the most vicious tools of colonization, those that can obliterate a culture or a nation, a tribe or a people's value system, then rank the UNSNA, UN System of National Accounts, among those tools. Quotes closed. Within this framework, all countries calculate their GDP, GDP, a measure that divides countries into developed and developing, rich and poor, powerful and powerless by making a distinction between productive and reproductive work. The travesty that is the GDP continues to measure imperfectly and patently wrongly, and yet continues to be the dominant tool of the global economy, marginalizing those who are economically poor, lack influence, and attract little attention and investment other than through extraction, accumulation, and attendant upon these depletion. I think there's so much being written recently on GDP um, and the problems that it presents us with. 
Fundamentally, this approach to the economy continues to take the work of life making that we call social reproduction for granted. As given and costless, even as the costs of what the feminist political economy uh, economists call social reproduction mount up. Social reproduction concerns the maintenance of life as well as its reproduction and the reproduction of ideologies that stabilize capitalist social relations, but also challenge these. This work remains outside the UNSNA's production boundary, unaccounted for in GDP, especially that which is unpaid. This in turn obfuscates the costs of social reproduction, leading to depletion of those who are engaged in this labor. The concept depletion through social reproduction was inspired by Diane Elson's observation that care work is not endlessly elastic and by the work of green economists who suggested environmental depletion needs to be debited from the GDP to get an understanding of its impact um, on our economy and society. Catherine Hoskins, Dania Thomas, and I wrote a paper called Depletion, the Cost of Social Reproduction, which was published in the International Feminist Journal of Politics in 2014, 10 years ago. In this paper, my colleagues and I conceptualized depletion as follows. Depletion results when the outflow of social reproductive labor, time, energy, lack of sleep and rest, for example, exceeds the inflow of resources, good food, adequate shelter, rest and sleep, for instance, tipping those affected over the threshold of insustainability. Consent does not mitigate depletion, just as love does not make social reproduction less depleting. Depletion through social reproduction is a concept that also bridges the world of paid and unpaid work. Paid work is affected by unpaid work in the home and vice versa, and the burden of both intensify harm. We also outline three strategies of reversing harm, through mitigation or individual strategies, through replenishment with state and non-state support systems, and through transformation or structural change to redistribute social reproductive work and its recognition at both state and international levels. Therefore, harm to individuals, households, and communities remains central to the conceptualization of depletion, which I develop further in the book. The unequal distribution of social reproduction that leads to the unequal experience of depletion harms those who care. This harm through depletion is multifaceted to physical and mental health, through discursive violence, as well as to citizenship entitlements and affects everyone engaged in social reproduction differently. In the last 10 years, this concept has found interdisciplinary audiences and has been used to frame the work of geographers, political economists, global development scholars, sociologists, and lawyers. So what does the depletion lens, together with the social reproduction lens, allow us to recognize, assess, measure, and address? How does a focus on depletion reveal social injustices that alert us to strategies to reverse it? First, attention to harm through social reproduction done in the past through reproduction necessary for the continuance of slavery, for example, can lead us to the politics of restorative justice. Through focusing on the harm done in the present to developing strategies to mitigate its worst manifestations, Anticipatory harm, which I develop as a concept in the book, can both deplete through intensifying anxiety of what is imagined but over which there is little control, as well as help to strategize to stop what is not yet present. Second, strategies for reversing depletion cannot be successful if society as a whole states, markets, individuals, non-state and collective actors does not acknowledge this harm in measurable ways. Measurement here does not have to claim objectivity and truth. Measurement is an important means of recognition. 
individual strategies of mitigating harm and reversing depletion can only be limited, unequal, and indeed can intensify harm for others, buying in labor to do your domestic work, for example. State intervention in addressing the unequal distribution of social reproductive work is therefore essential, if not sufficient, for replenishment as a strategy for reversal of harm. Collective strategies such as communing, cooperatives, and support networks also replenish. Third, a transformative vision of a good life for all, rather than for just for some, must include human as well as planetary care. Depletion of our environment is entangled with capitalism's pursuit of cheap nature, as Jason Moore has called it, and harms us and future generations. Several reports show how increasing temperatures in India, for example, are affecting the health of pregnant women, leading to miscarriages and heat strokes as they labor in the fields under the scorching sun, their labor still not counted for. The World Bank reports that only one-tenth of the world's greenhouse gases are emitted by the 74 lowest income countries, but they will be the most affected by the effects of climate change. Compared to the 1980s, they have already experienced approximately eight times as many natural disasters in the past 10 years. And by 2050, the report continues, 216 million climate refugees will have been displaced in six world regions, with the top three being the, in Sub-Saharan Africa, East Asia and Pacific, and South Asia. Finally, the recognition of depletion as harm must recognize the location and histories of inequalities that cast long shadows on the current care regime. Race, gender, class, and coloniality are vectors of this inequality. Depletion also cuts across unequal boundaries of North and South. For example, care gaps in the global North are filled by labors of precarious, uh, precarious workers uh, traveling long distances from the global South, leaving care gaps of their own in and uh, depleting communities in the sending countries. According to the ILO, the number of international migrant workers is also growing, and a conservative estimate is of 8.5 million women and 3 million men, which is an underestimation for, by, uh, according to many people. Through focusing on depletion, then, we can begin to reveal the full costs of social reproduction. To understand the circuits of power that circulate through the regimes of reproduction and production, and of how these might be challenged and reversed. In essence, depletion fundamentally affects the material conditions of reproduction and maintenance of social life, and the struggles for reversing depletion can help us think through the transformation of social reproduction and fundamentally of our global society. As I notice, uh, noted already, depletion is not irreversible, but it's not easy to reverse either because it is anchored in structural inequalities of gender, race, caste, and class, which are essential to the reproduction of capital social relations. The struggles to reverse depletion as outlined in the book and what I believe to be uh, my central argument take different forms. Through individual attempts to develop networks of friendships or laments against not being able to do so, depending upon extended family networks, through strategies of self-care wherever possible, and through challenging and holding the state accountable through political mobilizations. State discourse of development, for example, in South Africa is backed by inviting foreign capital to invest in mining in the Kolobeni region in Eastern Cape, which has revealed deep connections between gender relations, environmental extractivism, and temporalities of depletion, harming communities and their life worlds. And I talk about this and I write about this in the book by looking at the uh, work of a photographer uh, his name is Tom Pierce, and do go and look up his 
exhibitions online. One is called The Price of Gold, and this one is called Kolobeni. Um, in terms of just holding the state accountable and how this community is so worried about what is to happen. So how does anticipatory harm lead to intensified depletion? Holding the state accountable and stopping anticipated harms is an ongoing struggle, which includes legal strategies and popular mobilizations. But the question that I also want to raise here is that mobilization is not without costs. So in this particular struggle, uh, there have been lots of violence by the state against those who mobilize against the mining company. In other struggles as well, I've written about that in the past, the question emerges, who does social reproductive work when you are doing political work outside? So does intensifying depletion result from political mobilization? And what can we do to support that? Support mobilizations, but also to campaign for redistribution of social reproductive work. In all these struggles, of course, location matters. Standing in one place rather than another, whether it is along the boundaries of, of class or race, caste or sexuality, of formal and informal work, of waged and unwaged labor, provides vistas and possibilities of social reproduction and depletion that converge as well as diverge. And this is something that we are working uh, on at SOAS, uh, a group of us, feminist political economists, in trying to pluralize what we call um, pluralizing social reproductive uh, production approaches by thinking about how standing in one place, the global south, in, uh, changes our understanding of social reproduction as well. So it doesn't just change our understanding of what production is and what social reproduction is, but also uh, how do we rethink some of the aspects of social reproduction. As Sue Ferguson notes, it is not just what we do to reproduce society, but where we do it that counts in an imperial capitalist world. If location is taken seriously, the family form and as well as the understanding of production and social reproduction and the place of labor and work in capitalism would have to be rethought, as would then the consequent different forms of depletion. If the binary that is generated in the global north between productive and reproductive realms is not always sustainable in the global south, then different forms of depletion become relevant to our discussion. Without decentering the analysis of social reproduction and through it of depletion, a north centric approach can also undermine efforts to build solidarities across laboring um, uh, boundaries, laboring classes. I would suggest that depletion as a concept also decenters. Focusing on the costs of social reproduction allows for the light to be cast on relationships that in invoke love as well as pain, joy as well as exhaustion, solidarity as well as exploitation. Depletion as a concept decenters middle class notions of care that obfuscate the complexity of the labor of care by revealing the circuits of power in which social reproduction is enmeshed which depletes individuals, households, and communities with different intensity, leaving significantly diverse routes out of it, depending on their socioeconomic locations. When I was working originally on this uh, conceptualizing depletion, I went and talked to, because of my interest in the GDP, the person who was chairing uh, the GDP unit in the Office of National Accounts. And he assured me that changing the calculation of the GDP is not a problem for statistician, just like Marilyn Waring told us in 1988. But he said, it is a problem if you can't calculate the value of love. Now I had to remind him that if the redistributive 
uh, labors, uh, sorry, redistribution of social reproduction doesn't take place in his home because he was referring to the love with which his wife makes his dinner every day, he might have a problem, but uh, not with the calculations. He said, and quite rightly, it is a political question. The book was written largely through a crisis, the COVID pandemic. But of course, this is not the only crisis that has been impinging on my work and the lives of so many. Other crises, environmental, financial, political, and social conflicts have all been, have all seen the intensification of depletion as people struggle to resource social reproduction with racialized and gender division of labor, making life work difficult. Crises are historically layered. The pandemic struck when the regimes of austerity, of racism, and of precarity were already operative, intensifying the crisis of social reproduction, intensifying depletion. All crises have this potential of differently intensifying depletion of those who have to cope every day with the constrained lives that crises produce. Melissa Johnson and Janti Lingam have argued that studies of war and conflict show the thread of violence between war front and home front, also uh, Raquel and Enlo. They use the depletion framework uh, in Myanmar and Sri Lanka to analyze both depletion through and off social reproduction, which they argue under conflict conditions, which we have referred, both Laura and Alexandra referred to, increases women's depletion. They argue that in these conflict zones, increased depletion was due not only to increased social reproductive labor, as everyday tasks of life making take longer under hazardous conditions, but also because of the intervening effects of conflict and violence against women. Depletion, they argue, can be seen as a deliberate tactic of conflict. However, here, I also want to acknowledge that we are discussing social reproduction and depletion in the shadow of a genocide, where depletion seems, to me anyways, an inadequate word to capture the utter collapse of life-making in Gaza. The unimaginable roll call of loss in Gaza makes me stop short, unable to understand what is going on there in terms of depletion through social reproduction. This is not depletion, but a catastrophic collapse of social reproduction, of life-making. Social reproduction in the context of colonialism and anti-colonial and anti-extractivist struggles has been characterized as resistance. Producing life and reproducing communities under threat is an act of resistance for sure. In Gaza, too, social reproduction, socially productive labor continued under the dreadful conditions of deprivation and oppression. Depletion in this context affects everyday life through regulation of space, time, and state violence. To survive was also to resist, as uh, Chilmerian and Pratt have argued in the context of a systematic Israeli policy of elimination of Palestinians. However, under conditions of unparalleled and unremitting and indiscriminatory bombing, the reproduction and maintenance of life becomes almost impossible. The genocide we are witnessing every day on our TV screens shows an escalation of violence resulting in the collapse of both physical and social infrastructure, homes, hospitals, schools, and universities, and playgrounds have all been pulverized, destroying lives as well as futures. So in all humbleness and with great deal of anger and pain, I acknowledge the limits of depletion as a concept in the face of annihilation of a people. As you can tell, depletion is not an optimistic concept. However, as I look back to the life stories of individuals, households and communities that were shared with me as I did the research for my book, I find much to be hopeful about. This is because despite the challenges of un- and mal-recognized socially productive work, despite balancing care work with paid work under conditions of class disprivilege, we find individuals, households, and communities struggling against the structures of everyday exploitation, 
imagining different lives and coming together in friendship and solidarity to try and reverse their own and their community's depletion, present and anticipated. Prefigurative approaches to change are being mobilized to reimagine social justice. We can look at the work of um, Davina Cooper, Nicola Yates, Cohen and Morgan for some of these. In the context of social reproduction, this means addressing both care and caring such that those who care do not suffer continuing depletion of and through this work. However, these prefigurative imaginaries are also embedded in long histories of gendered, classed, and raced oppressions and locations, as I've already noted, issues not only of recognition, but also of redistribution. State and non-state actors have a role to play in these reimaginings, but they also do this within constraints of historical structures of empire and of capitalism. I will now share some examples of attempts at reversing depletion through local struggles, which open up new avenues of reshaping social reproduction in every day in, uh, at the three levels discussed in the book, mitigation, replenishment, and transformation. As far as mitigation goes, I've already touched upon the fact that we all try and mitigate those of us who can afford to our our uh, socially productive work, our labors, by buying in others' labors. But corporations are also getting in on the act. Corporations are investing in health and care sectors in response to growing demand, especially regarding the COVID, uh, uh, sort of, um, as we saw during the COVID pandemic. Deloitte's report on public health notes, and I quote, Reimagining the future of public health with, will require to forge new partnerships across public and private health care providers, new sources of investment for the wellness of communities, fresh market entrants bringing in diverse skills and expertise, and taking significant strides for digitizing public health. Quotes closed. This allows for development of global practices of commercial caregiving in wealthy countries and for wealthy people, marginalizing the care and health needs of others. This also makes the care sector vulnerable to the ups and downs of the global market. Sudden closures of care homes as a result of market fluctuations, increase in prices of rent, electricity, and food costs, for example, undermines these mitigatory strategies and increases depletion in periods of economic crises. Other innovative approaches to care imagine mitigation through use of technology. Film and television project, uh, uh, film and television project AI robotic domestic workers when all of us will be uh, masters and nobody will be slaves uh, except those robots uh, and experts in health to look to digital technology to save money and free up human clinical time and to build hospitals without walls again from that Deloitte report. Mitigation is the most prominent strategy of reversing depletion. It however remains largely individualized and connects the worlds of paid and unpaid social reproduction. Replenishment, like mitigation, is an important but limited strategy, I would argue, to reverse depletion. In lobbying the state, most feminist social policy debates on care focus on how to mobilize state resources that are fiscal, discursive, and policy-oriented. This results in internal tensions in state policy, austerity, migration controls, regulation of care homes, funding of social care as opposed to health and medical care, taxation, insurance. All of these are connected and affect articulation of care policies in the global north. Changing family forms, urbanization and precarious welfare regimes and increasingly uh, are increasingly issues of climate change uh, and just transitions affect state policies and systems of care in the global south. At the international level, the UN has accepted, as the UN Secretary General noted in uh, 2019, that, and I quote, 
the perceived narrative and the economic empowerment of women as a tool for economic growth is a win-win situation for all neglects the dangers of overwork among the poorest women, given that they struggle with intense and heavy paid and unpaid workloads leading to time poverty and depletion. Quotes closed. Struggles for recognition of social reproductive work then, especially unpaid care work, have resulted in shifts in international social policy, especially if you look at SDG 5.4, which calls for the recognition of unpaid care work. All these agreements contain legally binding obligations for states to address the issues of inequality and improvement in conditions of work. However, there is practically no progress in revising the calculation parameters of GDP as a measure for growth. And indeed, development of growth and indeed development, despite strong critiques of this measure, with ongoing consequences for reframing social reproductive work. I think I did some work on this. If you look at um, SDG 5 and SDG 8, which is sort of you know, conditions of work, together you find that that tension between GDP uh, not being challenged and yet the demand for women's work or sort of unpaid work to be counted remains very evident. These contradictory signals in international policy framing then lead to a logjam that is far from resolving the issues of depletion and of recognizing, reducing, and redistributing unpaid care and domestic work, which Diane Nelson um, called the three R's, triple R. Non-state initiatives to care for the planet are taking off as well. Some like the Kolobeni community's struggles against mining and dispossession that I have discussed anticipate harm and take legal action. Others bear witness to harms to the land done in the past, such as the knitting nanas of Australia working with indigenous women. An important initiative has been young people taking their governments to court to protect their futures. In a first, in the U.S.'s first constitutional climate trial in 2023, the judge ruled in favor of a group of young plaintiffs who had accused state officials in Montana of violating their rights to a healthy environment. And Europe's highest human rights court in a landmark ruling that could have implications across the continent ruled that countries must better protect their people from the consequences of climate change, siding with a group of older Swiss women against their government. But the legislature in Switzerland has just rejected this ruling, despite the fact that 42% of uh, MPs in the Swiss parliament are women. Politics matters. Peace activism, such as people protesting on the streets of London every other Saturday against the war in Gaza, demanding ceasefire now, needs also to focus on rebuilding of social, uh, social infrastructure after peace, of hospitals, schools, universities, but also shifts in the gendered division of um, domestic labors. Such envisioning of doing social reproduction differently can be critically important to reverse depletion. But all this activism, as I've already noted, also requires labor, in addition to the everyday labors of social reproduction. Depletion that then attaches itself to these labors for change, often leading to burnout. The sustainability of social movements requires the redistribution of social reproductive work. Constant vigilance against backsliding and backlash also generates depletion. The two steps forward, one step backwards, or often political status after campaigns can lead to disappointment, disengagement, and depletion of not only political communities of struggle, but also imagining new futures of transformation. So transformation and struggles towards it need more radical approaches that challenge the current status quo. Debates about universal basic income, about degrowth, post-development, about commoning of land and labor, all seek to transform our current modes of social reproduction, of people's well-being, and of environments that are, we are embedded in. 
There is also a returning interest in Marxism and of ideas of socialism, of economic arrangements and social practices that supplant dominant capitalist forms. Futuring imaginaries also include methodological approaches. GDP, including unpaid social reproduction, for example, or including in GDP, unpaid social reproduction. Although one could argue that the household satellite accounts already tell us what the value of this labor is, the fact that the GDP does not yet include either the depletion of environment or the value of social reproduction means that policies based on these calculations of economic growth continue to compound and exacerbate the consequences of depletion. Thus, campaigns to include both environmental and social reproductive depletion in uh, GDP calculations continue. In practical, concrete, and everyday utopias that Panich and Gindin talked about, we can see, uh, we can reimagine our world then. How do we approach this change? Redistribution of resources of labor can be generated only through struggle for which cross-border alliances are essential, whether these borders are of identities, of class, or of nationalities. However, mobilization for change have also been marked by inequalities. Without developing alliances across these border differences, what Nancy Fraser has called boundary struggles, change cannot happen. Alliances without recognition of histories of oppression and of unequal social relations can only be fragile. Building sustainable and reflexive solidarities that link networks working to reverse depletion is therefore an urgent political task. Speaking and listening across boundaries of difference is difficult enough at a personal level. To scale it up politically takes a great deal of effort, energy, attention, and care. <laughs> Solidarities are developed in time and need to be sustained over time. Processes of communication are important for not just building solidarities, but also maintaining them. Like a lack of investment in, so in social infrastructure or the fraying of political institutions, the fracturing of solidarity can leave deep scars on the social fabric of life. What I call reflexive solidarity, Yegi describes as a symmetrical, mutual, and reciprocal relation. It seems somehow to transcend the very dichotomy between altruistic and egotistic motivations. A structural analysis of capitalism and the marginalized place that social reproduction and its depleting effects continue to occupy within it suggests that sadly, as per your theme, social justice does not lie at the heart of development policy, discourses, and practices. I hope I have demonstrated that depletion is an urgent issue for development as it cuts across reproduction and production, global north and south. So my book, but also this talk, really is a plea to recognize these costs of social reproduction and to stop the harm to ecologies of life making and is flourishing through mobilizations of new imaginaries and activism that is both reflexive and sustainable. Reversing depletion is urgent and demands a solidaristic and transformative approach to world making. Thank you. Thanks, Shirin, for this uh, talk that I find most inspiring. Okay, so how we um, organize uh, the q and I'm going to take uh, four uh, questions per round and then give some time to Shireen to get her thoughts together and uh, answer. And we can end this at uh, 2.15, just in time for our refreshments. Uh, I see already a hand there. Um, thank you. Thank you, Shireen. Uh, Sunil Kumar from Social Policy at the LSE. <clears throat> I find your talk very, very powerful, especially the concept of depletion as linked to social reproduction. And it also brought to my mind the issue of bare life, the idea of bare life. Right? Um, I wanted to ask you that we talked a lot about the people whose social reproduction is being depleted, but not so much about the depleters. And that is not simply the state, 
but actors in civil society and actors in political society. And even if you think it in terms of purely economic relationship, wages for domestic work, for example, are part of what you call the cycle of depletion. So I wondered what you might have to say about how these individuals in society who engage in depletion, but almost believe that paying somebody is sufficient, a sufficient kind of trade-off, if you like, for that activity. Thank you. Time for, yes, all the three questions. There is one over there. Keep them up and I'll remember you. Thank you very much, Sharon, for uh, an amazing uh, talk. I'm Andy Newsham. I'm in development studies, and I could see I've got a lot to learn from you. One is a comment. It's not so much about what you've said, but it's about something that's come up. So it's for everyone, really. Um, the importance of acknowledging genocidal acts in, in, in uh, Palestine, for instance. I kind of struggle with this because I see that we give rightly so much attention to this we do not give the same attention to the concerns about genocide in sudan right now being perpetrated by people who have form in this area from 20 odd years ago whose rise to kind of um political prominence are rooted in those uh, acts of genocide that we've already seen in darfur for instance when we don't give equal attention to uh, the civilian casualties of the, of the civil conflict in Ethiopia. The Nakba and the whole Israel-Palestine thing has received more attention than the second war in Congo, which by 2008, according to the UN, had claimed over 5 million lives, not just through conflict, but also through deaths, you know, related to kind of health because people couldn't get to, you know, food and stuff. So uh, I just wanted to sort of I don't know how we deal with this, but if we are going to talk about Gaza and uh, Israel and Palestine at this conference, I, I think that this it's really important to be aware of this kind of, you know, that this is as important as that, if you like. Just very quickly on love, could you say a little bit about, a bit more about love? I mean, I was struck by your um, question, your, your, your point that love does not make social reproduction less depleting and yet there's a a growing body of work on a sort of something that you might call like a politics of loving which is very much um alive to this problem so i uh, just wonder if you might say if a bit more about how you might see love contributing to um reversing these processes of depletion or the extent to which you think that's possible thank you There are two questions there, so I take a third and then I let Shireen answer for this round and then we start again. Here, please. Um, Theo Papiano, Open University. Thanks, thanks very much for um, your talk. Uh, hi, it's um, Theo Papiano, Open University. Thanks very much for, for your powerful talk. I wanted to ask you, um, so is um, recognition of the cost of social reproduction and the redistribution of resources um, a way forward. When I say redistribution of resources in a form of social policy, for example, is that what you're arguing for moving or resolving, dealing with this issue? Thank you. Thank you for all very important and interesting questions. So let me start with um, uh, thinking about those who deplete rather than those who are depleted. And I think that um, very often you're quite right to point this out uh, because we, we are, and development studies is no exception to this, our concerns very often are those who are exploited rather than those who exploit and that is a problem right uh, but i think in the book as well and in my talk i was trying to say that we need to pay attention to the fact that mitigatory strategies can actually be exploitative right and that exploitation comes in different forms one is just me individually getting somebody to clean my home i can pay them well but they are still 
doing something that is uh, um, allows me time away to come and give you give this talk, right? But also more importantly, it creates a, a care gap in their lives. So when they are doing paid work, somebody has to look after their families um, and carry out the unpaid work. And if nobody does that, or if that is very much seen as uh, the labor of a, the woman in the house, then it can intensify the depletion. So that is a thread that connects your question to, to what I was saying. In terms of, again, towards the end, I was just trying to say how certain other mitigatory strategies now are providing care for profit. So we have seen in this country, forget about others, this country, how uh, the investment of US corporations in our care sector has increased enormously recently. And that is about profit. Now we know from many studies um, in terms of age and aging, that if a care home closes, the chances of those who are living in that care home dying increase exponentially because just getting used to a new system again is not something that many people many of those uh, vulnerable people might be um, uh, uh, can can do um, so death rate actually it's so sort of you know rises if a, a, a care home closes and yet a profit driven care home would always prioritize the profit so i think we are seeing some of that happening in mitigatory circumstances the state, I'm thinking of much more in terms of social policy to connect with. So that is a replenishing strategy that individuals cannot mitigate at a, at a larger level across society unless there are state structures or what feminists call social infrastructure. So the state can do not just social policy, but the state can also invest in social uh, infrastructure. It seems really fascinating, right? If you think about even after the pandemic, the talk about investment seems to be all in housing, which is really important, and, and road building, infrastructure building, but not so much in investment in care, which employs so many people, right? Um, and and supports so many more families. And yet social policy somehow still is driven by that male breadwinner model, even though the labor market is changing, we know that the labor market is changing. So the question for us is not simply about what should they do, but the question to echo what you just said is, why are they not doing this? So one of the issues for me increasingly has become uh, what, you know, agnotology, like, you know, why the, the, the science of ignorance. What more do feminist political economists, what more do feminist development scholars, what more do uh, humanity scholars or philo philosophers, feminist philosophers, what more evidence do we have to produce in order to convince. Now, I also suggested that some of that convincing is happening. So in the UN systems, sort of saying, yes, unpaid labor should count uh, in SDG 5, um, great. But why is it not happening At, it, within the same document? And part of that then sort of comes to the structural analysis of capitalism. Can capitalism actually afford to count for this unaccounted world or work, or does it need that subsidy? Is that at the heart of its uh, uh, sustainability? So I think that social policy is really important and we have struggled for it, right? It's not just happened. We've all sort of, you know, contributed through our scholarship, through mobilizing, through lobbying, et cetera, but it's not sufficient. Um, and similarly, of course, sort of, you know, 
right from the very beginning. So, you know, technology has been seen to be, and those who produce that kind of technology, has seen to be a response to inequalities. Why, you know, we know that 1950s and the production of vacuum cleaners and all that, and that will somehow change uh, domestic labor. But those things are very limited. And so transformation okay. is really um, sort of what we are thinking about, which brings me to the question of love. Um, and yes, there is a lot, um, excuse me, I'll just have to drink. Oh. Uh, got these, these habits of, uh, costest habits of Indian drinking machine, right? Don't touch it with your mouth. <laughs> so, um, uh, so love does both things. Love oppresses, contracts your worlds, demands loyalties of particular kinds, uh, love expands horizons, love redis wants to redistribute labor. Love does both things. I was not suggesting that love is not a factor. I was suggesting that just because social norms, cultural norms, historical norms, distribute labor in particular ways, consent to those norms under the sort of structural conditions within which we operate should not be taken as, oh, well, nobody is objecting. Lack of objection cannot be in these circumstances taken as A, consent, and B, okay, in terms of socially productive labors. But when love is redistributive, whether that is a love for your country or love for your people or love for your partner, that can be a very powerful force. So I think, uh, and love is, like all the concepts we deal with, is also unequal in those terms, right? Um, so, And to go back to your question about um, Gaza and um, I think personally, for me, uh, you are quite right. There is, why go to Sudan and why go to um, sort of, you know, Yemen? Uh, what we know is poverty kills far more people than all these people being killed. And yet nobody talks about it in those terms. We don't talk about, we don't go and demonstrate. So there's always a hierarchy of pain that we cope with. And I think we are all trying to do, to stop bombs falling on those who are, we are falling now. But I do wonder, sort of, you know, those, those rallies are not happening every Saturday now. There will be a longer time. The, the Gaza thing is not, even in the Guardian, the Gaza conflict is not the headline anymore. That is what we are coping with, but that doesn't make it wrong to focus just now on what is happening in Gaza. Thank you. I have a question here. Yep. Uh, hi, uh, I'm Sara Stevano from Economics here at SOAS. Um, Thank you so much for the very inspiring talk, Shirin. And as you know, I've been inspired by your work on depletion even before listening to this talk. Um, I would like to ask you a question about the GDP, which you mentioned a few times. Um, so can you elaborate a bit more on whether you think that uh, accounting for the costs of social reproduction in the GDP statistics uh, is a way to um, improve our, how we measure economic activity, but also a way to reverse the processes of depletion. Thank you. Oh, there are a couple of questions. Yes, I have one here. Hi, uh, my name is Franca. Um, I'm a, I just started my PhD in uh, social movement studies, and this was uh, um, yeah related very much to what I'm concerned with right now. Like I started first to 
look at internationalism in social movements and now I'm moving more towards emotion and love as well and I'm really happy to be able to talk about these things in these spaces too so thank you so much um yeah I would love to hear a bit more about yeah I think I mean you talked about it but um yeah these conflicting emotions and um yeah like activist burnout and depression it's mm -hmm. very um widespread right now like um it's very hard to stay hopeful and um, to what extent is it possible to, um, yeah, to have love coexisting with these emotions as well? Um, yeah. And also, how do you see the difference between love and solidarity? Is it always um, interpersonal connections or how do we extend that towards, uh, yeah, the this uh, transformation of the world? And yeah, thank you. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Professor Rai, uh, for your wonderful lecture. Yeah, I am <laughs> Bagish, uh, and uh, I'm also an education policy researcher from India. Uh, while listening to your uh, lecture, I was uh, feeling like uh, there's something missing when we are talking about, particularly in Indian context, about the care workers, about the domestic workers, and particularly, I would like to um, bring your attention to the caste question, because uh, when we talk about the social reproduction and depletion, uh, I think that there has been an historical injustice because we are talking about social justice now these days. And there has been a radical shift if we see from the political lens, because the people who always uh, um, rejected the question of representation within the Indian parliament are now supporting that. And uh, in 90s, the situation when the women reservation was uh, introduced, it was highly objective. Mm. And now they, the same political uh, actors are now accepting those, though it, it has been passed by the Indian parliament and it will be implemented around 2034. So it, it's still a long way to go for women representation, but I'm more curious about to know, or maybe to about your views on how these social realities in this changing political context, where the right wing um, is also accepting the social representation identities, and how these identities uh, of social reproduction of the historically marginalized uh, Identity, identities, particularly Dalit, Adivasi, and Muslim women in Indian context. And how do you see that uh, there's the whole idea of depletion and how to uh, provide them with a particular place where they can raise their voice there on their own? Nobody is going to raise any question for them. So how they will do this? So that is my concern to you. Thank you very much. Right. Big questions. <laughs> um, okay, so let's start with Sarah's question on GDP. Um, so I think when I first presented this, um, there are two aspects to it. One is the technical aspect. How do you value and how do you produce the value of? And as that's why I said that sort of household satellite accounts are doing that now. And across a whole range of countries, we now accept that about if we were to include social reproduction in the GDP, GDPs would rise by about 20 to 40%, depending on you know, the various technical calculations, which I don't really need to uh, go into just now. So that's the kind of, you know, and that's why um, uh, the, the person that I was talking to, he said, it's a statistical issue. It's not, it's not a political issue that we are dealing with. Um, the bigger question that I think you are looking, pointing to is about would it make a difference, right? Now, my question, and this question was asked to me many years ago by Anne Phillips, who said, oh, so do you think that GDP is the way into or will it transform? Is it a transformative uh, uh, possibility? And I would say that no, it isn't. And yes, it is. Why? Because otherwise we would not be talking about the minimum wage, right? Waged work is always value producing, always exploiting, exploited, uh, exploited. And so what do we say? Do we not worry about what a minimum wage should look like? What should be 
uh, kind of a, a lack of, um, sorry, um, the gender um, gap between labor, sort of, you know, uh, wages for, for the same, um, same labor. All those are political issues as well. Our argument in the original paper and what I have definitely seen strengthened in the book was that the problem is because GDP does not include unpaid labor in particular, but socially productive labor as a category, those who do that labor, and we know that that is a feminized labor in the labor market anyway, so the prices are, are low and, and the wages of those who do this work is low. We know that um, this work needs to have lost the, the, the thread of my thought. Yeah, uh, so if, if, uh, if this is not recognized, the importance of recognition is that then those who do this work are not seen as contributing to the economy. And if they're not contributing to the economy, they are a drain upon the economy. So that's what I meant about saying that citizenship entitlements get affected if you don't include this. Think about the press talking about hardworking families. Well, what they mean is hardworking, taxpaying families. Everything seems to revolve around who pays, who does paid work, what sort of paid work, do they tax, do they pay their taxes or not? So the whole non-doms thing, et cetera, et cetera. So these are issues which become possible to raise if GDP is calculated differently. So it is a discursive violence that people actually experience every day to be told, and we know through time use surveys now, how long is the day of women who work in the unpaid sector, right? And yet to be told every day that you're not working, there was a wonderful Oxfam uh, 2019 report in India, India, Oxfam India report, in which they said that allows that discursive violence to be converted into physical violence sometimes because men think they can, you know, they have the right to expect good food. They have a right to expect timely uh, dinners. They have, you know, blah. So there's a direct connection between discursive and actual violence. The second thing is that if such work is done, then of course, we're going back to the question of social policy, we could see much more interest and investment in social infrastructure than we see now. So on both counts, at the individual level, but also at the state level, we find the relationship shifting. But nothing will happen unless it is not fought over, unless we don't mobilize. So to, to talk about the second question in terms of love and mobilization, et cetera, it becomes really important. I mean, this is a struggle, right? These are not some things sort of, you know, some, some benefits that are given to you. And yet, as Bernice Reagan said, sort of, you know, like it is hard work. Not only is it hard work, but in some conditions, it can be very dangerous work. It's okay for us to talk about mobilizing and being empowered, but it can also empower, sort of mobilization can also elicit violence against the person who is mobilizing. You know, people who march, you can, you can uh, be, be attacked, um, et cetera. So we need to think about the, the, that aspect of mobilization as well. And so love, for me, I mean, I've not worked in on love. I'd love to work on love, but I haven't. <laughs> and sometimes I do feel that it is, uh, you know, we are now talking about emotion and politics a lot. And I think emotions matter in politics. They matter also in the economy, you know, for, for the reasons that I just said. So I think that sustainability of political activism needs redistributive aspects of social reproduction. Otherwise, so when to go back to your, uh, your question at the end about India, 
when I was uh, interviewing the women MPs uh, for my for my book on the Indian Parliament, I was so struck by the fact that they did not have any other strategy for doing socially productive work other than mitigation. So if they were rich enough, they employed people to look after them. We all know domestic labor market in India is very large. Or family. So sisters, mothers-in-law, you know, friends. They didn't talk about the state providing proper creches. The parliament doesn't have a proper creche in India. They might want more women in parliament, but what about supporting them? Oh, the problem is always that, you know, individually they will hire a servant or a nanny. So there are issues about institutions being gender, sort of gender unequal. It's not just good enough to say, you know, and secondly, women are also political actors. They are not just women as women. So that's why I gave the example on, uh, of Switzerland, where 42% of the MPs are women, but they are also women who are conservative or liberal. They are sort of women who might not think that climate change is a, a big issue for us. They might think that the, the courts are taking over um, sort of, you know, uh, areas of, of concern which are sh properly uh, should be with parliament, whatever their politics might be. Just being a woman in itself is not the issue. What is at issue is why do we as a society have 50% population that is women, what hindrances are we placing in their way that 50% of women cannot be in parliament? So if these are important issues around justice, social justice that this conference wants to address. And I don't feel able to say that just because you've got 20 BJP women in parliament, somehow they are only women, they will look after women's interests. That's not the argument I'm making. So uh, so I think um, in terms of India, you are quite right. I mean, there has been now, uh, even though it wasn't as bad as we thought it would be, a third term of a very right-wing government, uh, which thinks, and when I was again interviewing these women, they think that men and women are equal, but different, and they have different roles, and they should stick to those roles, right? After all, Sushma Swaraj was the foreign minister in India or secretary of state, you know, sort of uh, uh, or foreign secretary. Um, and yet she told me, she says, we want more women in, in, in politics. We want to mobilize more women. Why? Because women, unlike men, are the um, uh, sort of, uh, they will protect our culture much more than men. Men have become too westernized. Different politics. I'm not saying that uh, Margaret Alba from Congress would say the same thing or a center party or uh, uh, people, uh, women from the left would say the same thing. No, it is the right wing has a politics which is a gender politics, but it's a conservative gender politics. And we need to pay attention to that. You're quite right. So I don't think that uh, um, it is simply a question of identity. I do think it's a question of politics. And yes, until we get an investment in social infrastructure in India, this is not going to sort of reduce depletion for women. Last round of question. I'm gonna take the last three, which I already spotted, which is great, one, two, and three. I would just want you to paint for us, if possible, your vision of the future in a world where we're increasingly going towards the algorithm capitalism, where some of the things we did before, um, it's now being monetized. And I'm wondering, with the uh, domestic caregivers, it's informal and it does not pair very well with the GDP because they're not represented there. But I remember once that in Ghana, one of the 
um, wives of a politician wanted to organize the domestic workers in, in a way that they would be workers, just like everybody's tried to organize the sex workers to introduce what they make into the GDP as well. So I'm wondering, with this, will we have a sort of Uber for domestic workers to make them formal? And when they become formal, what do you see to that? What is going to happen when this informal sector becomes formal and they're entitled to pension, they're entitled to work conditions, what effect would it have on knowledge producers, for example, for lecturers, for professors who need to use these services? Yeah. Um, hi, thank you very much for the talk. Um, on the question of um, politics and social reproduction, um, just wanted to mentioned that um, recently the British Home Office has made it, um, I mean, has stopped um, visas for partners and children of care workers. And I was just wondering, you know, is this an instance of um, interna interna internationalization of depletion? If we keep the last one short, we give yeah. her like five minutes to answer. Thank you, Shireen. Um, I it will be short and slightly controversial. <laughs> this is Salava Ibrahim. I, I'm talking, I wanted to ask you about, or I wanted to be slightly controversial in your call for solidarity among those who are depleted, because I'm one of those, okay? Um, I slept two hours, I'm a single mom, and I was cleaning the house until midnight, and then woke up at 2.30 for a bedwetting incident, right? So, if we're asking those who have the burden of depletion to do the solidarity, my question is, who has an invested interest to change the system? Mm -hmm. Like if we're putting the actual burden of change on those who are depleted, where is the role of legal reform? Where is the role of power changing for those who are not doing their role? You mentioned extended families, but you didn't mention partners right, who are not doing their responsibilities. So there needs to be an element of legal as well as other role for changing those who have an invested interest to maintain the current system. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Shirin, you have you. five, five minutes. minutes exactly to uh, address <laughs> okay, all these. So let, like, me start, let me start with that. Uh, I was not suggesting, I mean, I'm quite concerned about putting the burden on those who are depleted. I was saying that burden is, and we all, you might be here today, but you also might be on the march against Gaza. You know, that is not the point. The point is exactly this investment in social uh, social infrastructure. I did not mention, I did not think that, you know, partners should not be uh, involved in. I said those women, those right-wing women talked about their families and actually women in the families. So of course, men and women should both sort of, you know, or partners of whatever gender should both be involved in um, social reproductive work equally, not just when you want to and when it's convenient. Um, so that is an easy one to, to, to answer. Uh, but, but the question that you raise about those who are affected. Well, the fact remains that unless those who are affected struggle, those who benefit, going back to the previous question, from exploitation will continue to exploit. So there is no question, but the, uh, but the alliance that I was talking about was more between, and, and the divisions that I was talking about was more also, that, which we have seen within feminism, right? On grounds of class, on grounds of caste, on grounds of race, on grounds of religion. Um, and my point was that unless you think through reflexively as to how do you sort of, you know, bridge make bridges across those divisions, which we are now much better placed to not only identify, but to reflect upon, 
those alliances will not last for very long. And the collapse of those alliances then actually is very depleting, right? If I go to a feminist conference and come back feeling that my voice has not been heard, I feel much worse than when I went expecting solidarity. So that's all, that was the point I was, I was trying to make. In terms of, where are we? Um, who was that? Sorry, I'm, oh, my brain is also, oh yeah, the future and, um, and is that internationalizing depletion? Um, uh, Safri and, and um, Graham wrote a wonderful piece on the global household in, it's quite an old piece now. And we all know from the literature on the care chains, not just production chains, that that's exactly what's happening. As I was also saying, sort of, you know, when you move sort of, you know, across tense borders, to come and work in this country as a care worker, somebody is looking after your kids or your older parents or you know your community. And so of course it is increasing depletion. We also know from time use surveys done for uh, with domestic workers in the United States that your, your working day has lengthened because you are doing socially productive work after paid work digitally. So mothers going on WhatsApp and trying to see whether the ch their child has done homework. So lack of sleep, lack of um, uh, increased anxieties, and, and intergenerationally, depletion is increasing. So there's a whole chapter in my book on children, but we can also talk about grandmothers going to doing much more re reproductive work as those care gaps. I do not have in one minute uh, a utopia that I can share with you. But all I can say is that this is something which is an urgent issue that needs that needs attention. And unless we recognize it as such, we won't be able to strategize to reverse it. Thank you.